please welcome to the stage the founder of Black Hat, Jeff Moss. This is a pretty impressive, pretty impressive. I was working on my breakdance moves last night to impress you all, and I threw out my hip. So instead, I'm just going to stand here and be static. Okay, this is my, my big pleasure, uh, really, to introduce uh, you to the 20th year of Black Hat. This is year 2-0. Originally, when we started, it was really called the Black Hat Briefings, but really, now it's just Black Hat. It's taken on its own persona. And I've got, I want to give you a little bit of an insight on kind of where we came from, my view of maybe how the community started uh, and where we are today and where we're going. And uh, it'll be a little bit of a trip down memory lane, but then you're going to see it gets a little bit more serious toward the end. So, every year I announce statistics and where people come from, how many countries are here, how many people are represented. I want to shorten it down this year and just say that this year we've given away 205 scholarships to those students who wouldn't normally be able to attend. So if you are one of those 205, please raise your hand. Let's give them a round of applause for the hard work and making it to Vegas. We also have people from over 80 countries around the world who have flown to Vegas to be with us. Uh, to listen to what we're going to talk about uh, and to learn. And I think that's one of the largest numbers that we've ever had. Uh, so this is truly a global phenomena, and Black Hat has really turned into sort of a, the epicenter of a lot of that. And 20 years ago, 2000, or I mean, sorry, <laughs> 1997, um, I started Black Hat, and it was sort of by accident, uh, if you can believe that. I had been running DEF CON, and I kept getting these emails of people saying, write me a professional sounding announcement so I can convince my boss to send me to DEF CON, uh, from DEF CON to attend. And, uh, and so the first year I wrote a professional sounding announcement that sounded very corporate, it sounded like back then. And then, it, uh, and then, and finally my friend Ricklin, many of those who are back from the Unix hacking days, he said, why don't you just start a real conference, start like a real professional conference, charge people real money, give them real food, and, uh, and then you don't have to write those announcements anymore. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. I don't know why I didn't think of it, Ray thought of it, um, but I was the one that uh, I took a loan out, I saved up my money, I waited an extra year, and then I started Black Hat in 97. And because really, we were all pretty young back then, and there weren't a lot of jobs in InfoSec, who do you invite to speak? Well, you invite your friends. So if you look at that first year speaker lineup, it was just people I knew and I could call on the telephone and invite. So it was all my friends in Microsoft or uh, Novell or wherever it was, and all I wanted to do was get them in a room and hear what they're working on. Like, what's cool to them? What's it, what are their problems? What are they hacking on? And I didn't realize at the time that it was sort of a magic formula. When I asked people why they were attending Black Hat, it was, um, they said that it was a crystal ball. If the hackers and the security researchers were talking about it today, then it must be important. And in six months or nine next year, it's going to be their problem. So by coming to the show, they got a jump start on what was going to happen. And over the years, I've seen unicorn companies form based on ideas speakers at Black Hat, forensics, incident response, new product categories, cloud defense. And so really, I think one of the things you're going to take away, or I always take away from Black Hat, is that really we sort of are at the cutting edge of this. I mean, how many people, by show of hand, when you go home and you're talking with normal colleagues uh, or your friends in your town, they just don't quite get it the way that it, right? That's because I think this community, we really are at the, the edge thing. I can't tell. <laughs> We're just sort of at the um, And I also learned first year, never hold that in the same hotel. 
So what they'll do is they'll be in early and they'll eat all of your food and they'll drink all of your booze. So we quickly separated the two. And when that happened, we started creating two different cultures. Um, one, Black Hat, is much more InfoSec and enterprise focused. This is all about where the rubber meets the road. Stuff you learn here, you'll take home to your company and you'll be able to apply right away. DEF CON, maybe not so much. That's much more, in my mind, a hacking conference. It's like sort of the joy of discovery. You're taking apart a PlayStation one day and the next day you're hacking on a drone. Right? Not something maybe your boss will pay you to learn at work, um, but it activates a different creative portion of your brain. And so I think the two have, have really become complementary. And in those early days, you could really gather 10, 20 people in a room, and you'd have enough experts to actually take over the world. Nowadays, we probably need half this room to take over the world. Things have gotten so much more complex. Things have gotten uh, much more diverse. The nature of technology back then, also in the early days, meant that you were, not, you were only judged on what you thought how you behaved, what you did online. Um, there was no social networking, no pictures to show off to your friends, no scanners. And so in those early days, my formative years, I was really being judged on how I presented myself online. And nobody knew my gender, nobody knew my age. Um, I remember I'd be having conversations about sex and drugs and rock and roll when I was 13. And I'm not old enough to drive, to vote, uh, to enlist. But there I am, I'm sort of having this full, rich, adult experience online through my computer. And nobody would tell me that that was an incomplete or an inaccurate experience because nobody knew who I was or anything about me except what I revealed. And that was, uh, that was really important to me. And I didn't realize it, um, how much it's influenced the ways that the conferences have grown. So over the years, I've grown to believe that a good conference is really a balance of technical and social. I was more technical, and I didn't quite understand the importance of social until later on. But really, if you think about where we're going as an industry, it's more social. Your success in your field is probably going to be more dependent on your social skills going forward than maybe some of your technical skills. Um, if you saw the keynote from Halvar Flock at uh, Black Hat Singapore, it's online. Um, some of the writings from other people. Um, what I think is happening is offense is a very technical game, very sophisticated, with very simple metrics. Did you break in? Did you not break in? Did you succeed or not? Defense is much harder. The metrics, well, what are the metrics? Uptime? Um, dollars saved, OPEX, and also defense is hideously social. How much money are you going to spend on defense? Whose budget is it? How important is this asset to protect? Is it protected, quote unquote, enough? Um, how do we measure that success? All of those things are social and political and bureaucratic, and offense is just still very clean and technical. And because of those differences, um, you see a different focus um, in how people's careers develop. If you think about what has to happen for defense to ever be greater than offense, this is an idea Jay Healy came up with at the Atlantic Council and he wrote a paper on. Try to imagine what we would have to do to make defense greater than offense. And immediately you start jumping into all these social and political problems and bureaucratic and budget problems. So nowadays, today, as a community, we are relied on to help secure the infrastructure of not just the past, but the future. We are building the Internet of Things, smart cars, space, and it's going to be us in this room, people we know that are going to be uh, called on to protect these systems. And I think we have a responsibility because we're close to the levers, because we're close to the tech, and because we understand it, I think that gives us a special 
sort of social responsibility where we have to actually do something about it. If we can influence secure by default instead of open by default, then we should probably do that. We have, I think, a special obligation. Um, and if you look at what the problems are that we're facing, all of our problems are essentially global. They might have been local, now they're global. And how do you solve global problems? You have to have a larger, uh, more diverse perspective. Your use case edges in Palo Alto are different than use case edges in India or in an island that only has satellite connectivity and one update of your messenger app is gonna crush their budget, right? So I think for us to continue to grow and be successful, we also have to become uh, more diverse in our thinking, uh, more cognizant of the global nature, uh, and, and more aware of how we are actually uh, setting standards that are being followed. I'd say that really we are at the beginning of the end. It's been 20 years. I want to think about how we grow as a community. What do we need to do to build for the next 20 years? And I really want us to start thinking about the next generation behind us. How do we mentor? How do we bring people up? How do we involve them? And it could be any number of things. It could be a small thing like helping somebody submit at a CFP. It could be taking an hour a week and mentoring somebody. Or it could be financial. You might donate money for somebody to have a scholarship. But no matter what it is you do, I think we have to get engaged as a community because the diversity problem, the complexity problem, the lack of generalists becoming specialists mean that we need more people involved with a bigger and broader perspective. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for making the first 20 years great. And I'm planning to be here in another 20 years, <laughs> one way or the other, if I'm in a wheelchair or not. And so um, I want to thank you. And I want to introduce Philippe Courteau, the CEO of Qualys, who he's a man that really doesn't need uh, an introduction. They've been uh, supporting Black Hat for 15 out of 20 years. So they kind of caught on to what we were about really early. For 15 years, they've been a long time sustaining sponsor of Black Hat and uh, really saw software as a service, as a business model, sort of saw the cloud before the cloud. And I want to introduce Philippe, and he's going to introduce our keynote speaker, which I'm really proud of having this year, Alex. So with that, come on up. Philippe. Yeah. Thank you, Philippe. Good luck, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not so sure if I'm going to be able to continue for the next 20 years, but I guarantee you that I'm going to try. So, uh, <laughs> good morning to you all. It's really a real pleasure and an honor to introduce every year our keynote speaker. As uh, Jeff reminded us, Black Hat started many, many, years, many years ago as a gathering of security experts, uh, highly skilled and passionate about security. And <clears throat> also it became the fantastic uh, educational learning grounds. And that's really where I learn about security. And that's what makes Black Hat very special to me. So first, I would like to very sincerely thank Jeff <coughs> for having kept the soul of Black Hat alive. And this is not easy, especially when you grow so big. I also would like to thank UBM, which understood that. And that's what I believe makes Black Hat the very unique and the best security conference in the world. Now first, if, if we look today uh, at where we are, we are entering a world where everything is interconnected or will be interconnected with everything. <clears throat> and this is create a significant problem for security. Security has become the problem of scale. And it's at the same time a huge opportunity for us to put our mind together to essentially rethink the way we have been doing security and thinking about how we could build security 
in these new infrastructures, these new ways of communicating, rather than continuing bolting on as we have been doing in the past. So that's a huge opportunity for all of us. And as Jeff mentioned, it's only a community effort who can really get to that point. And this is why I'm particularly pleased to introduce our keynote speaker today. <clears throat> this is a man that grew, in fact, from the DEF CON and Black Hat days. And it's also a man that I knew since many, many years when Qualys at the very beginning of our company, when we asked at stake to review the security uh, infrastructure of our nascent cloud platform. Today, as the CISO, as the CSO of Facebook, he brings to us a very unique opportunity, a, a perspective as well as expertise. On one hand, he now understands scale, which is something that is very important for us to understand, but it also brings the expertise on how to leverage and serve and secure a community of more than two billion people on the planet. So this is quite significant. And this is the world that Jeff mentioned, the world which has become more social, but at a huge scale. And with that, I'm really very honored and happy to introduce the Chief Security Officer of Facebook, Alex Tamos, and a security geek at heart. Thank you very much. Hey everybody, good morning. As Philippe said, my name's Alex, Alex Damos. I'm the Chief Security Officer at Facebook, and I'm really, really honored to be able to come and speak to you on the, the 20th anniversary of Black Hat. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be up here and to follow uh, some really amazing keynotes, like my friend Jennifer Granick or my old At State colleague, Dan Gear. And so I'd like to first start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity, and I want to thank all of you uh, for coming out at 9 a.m. after what looked like a, a pretty successful first night of LobbyCon. Um, so appreciate you doing that. 20 years ago, I wasn't actually at Black Hat. I, I couldn't afford it. Um, but I was at DEF CON. That was my first year there. Uh, and while I had a very supportive father renting a hotel room and playing blackjack while I got to uh, explore the conference room at the Aladdin, I found something that year that I didn't know I was even looking for. And that was a place where I really felt that I belonged. Lana and Jeremiah Grossman have come to Take, have uh, come to call InfoSec a family. And I do think that metaphor holds pretty well. As far as families go, we're pretty dysfunctional. Um, but I know for a lot of people, myself included, coming to the desert every year and, and hanging out with Uncle Dark Tangent uh, feels a lot like a reunion. Um, and outside of the summer, a lot of people have built friendships outside of these conferences, outside of this community that are incredibly deep. We go to each other's weddings, we go to baby showers, um, and all too often, we, we celebrate the lives of people and, and pass their mourning, or mourn their passing. Uh, in 2002, when I wanted my, my then girlfriend to understand me, I actually brought her to Black Hat on our first vacation anywhere, right? Like, very romantic. Um, but it was important, because it was important for me uh, to make sure that uh, she could understand the people who I'm around, the people that uh, I consider uh, my professional peers. Uh, and she definitely did. And, 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 you know, 13 years of marriage later, she's still coming to every black hat with me uh, and has been welcomed as part of the family as well. For 20 years, I have been in awe of the raw talent that we have seen on stage at this conference. It's at the stage of Black Hat that I saw some of the first practical attacks against GSM networks. We saw an ATM machine spit $50 bills out. Um, we've seen a, a man attack his own insulin pump on stage. Uh, there's incredible work happens here. Uh, and I, you know, this year is no exception. I'm, I'm really excited for th some of the things that we're going to talk about. And I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about not just where we've been for 20 years, but for the next 20 years. Um, and some of the things I think we could do together to make the 20 years a little safer and a little more trustworthy for people. There was something edgy and transgressive about Black Hat in those early days. The, the idea that hacker kids 
and corporate executives and feds would come out and hang out in the desert uh, generated a lot of kind of funny press stories. Uh, and in fact, a number of the, the members of the media would try to, to sneak in and infiltrate uh, a conference that they could openly buy a badge for. Um, during this period of time, researchers were regularly getting sued by their work. Uh, for their work. Even though major software companies had started sending people to these conferences and then recruiting out of the hacker scene, the, the norms of how we're supposed to relate to the rest of the world were not uh, yet well developed. You guys remember how Black Hat used to give a book out of all the printed materials, right? It was about this thick. Uh, and then there was a, a CDR that came along with it. So there are a couple of years there in the early 2000s where there's rooms full of volunteers that had to go through every backpack, pull that book out, rip pages out of it for a talk, and then go and shred the CDs. Um, I remember Mike Lynn quitting his job on stage because he wasn't allowed uh, to talk about router vulnerabilities. Um, I remember the year that Dmitry Skalarov got pulled off a plane and arrested because of his talks about DRM. Um, this has been a real constant problem of the relationship and a lot of the frictions of our society about dealing with the impact of security on people's real lives have been played out here. My colleagues and I weren't immune. Uh, in 10 years ago, uh, we gave a talk at DEF CON and Black Hat uh, on the insecurity of common forensic software. Uh, this is with a of my ISEC colleagues, Tim Newsham, Jesse Burns, Chris Palmer. And sitting right there in the front row for both of our talks was our really good friend, Joe Gratz. Joe was our friend. He was a hacker at heart. Um, he was also an associate at one of the best litigation law firms uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and he was sitting in that front row with a suit fully pressed and ready hanging in his room at Caesars uh, because we had expected a federal restraining order to come down and to stop us from giving our talk. So there was a lot of conflict, but, but despite that conflict, there was still something kind of fun and light about the security field in those times. We were talking about real bugs and important systems, but in many ways, our scene was not directly interacting with the real world. We were escaping from the real world. I don't think I have to tell this group that those times have changed. Our community has always been very thoughtful about anticipating the practical, economic, and societal impact of our work. And in the early years, those concerns were pretty easily dismissed. Over the past 20, 10, 5, and I would say especially the last year, we've been completely vindicated. People now know how important it is to build secure systems to underline uh, our civilization. A topic that was once considered fringe, a topic that we had to fight for respect for, is now on the front page of every newspaper pretty much once a week. And while the times have changed, the community and the industry have not really changed with them. The truth is, is we are no longer the upstarts. We are no longer the hacker kids fighting against corporate conformity. My friends from those era, that era are now CEOs. CISOs, venture capitalists, a couple of them went and worked in the White House. So we don't fight the man anymore. In some ways, we are the man. Um, but we, we haven't really changed our attitude towards what kind of responsibility that puts on us. And I'm going to take a moment to talk about why I'm talking about both the community and the industry put together. There are other fields of professional conduct where the personal and the professional intersect so tightly. But it's very hard to, feel, to think of a field of technology where the community plays such an important gatekeeping role. Many of the people in this room, including myself, got into security culturally well before we were paid for it. That might meant hanging out on BBSs or IRC. That might have been saving up your summer job money so you could get a room at the Alexis Park. Uh, in a couple of cases I know of, that's because you were part of a, an, you're an unindicted co-conspirator of an 80s hacker group who decided to, to go straight. These communities can nurture talent, Community can challenge us. Communities create common language and goals. And personally, when I have faced challenges in my career, when I've had to make difficult moral decisions, it is the values of this community that I've surrounded myself for 20 years that have been incredibly important. Um, and as Jeff said, the things we are talking about this year are going to become the startups that you'll see over the next two years. So it's incredibly important to make sure that our community has the values and the culture that is right to move the community and the industry forward together. And the unfortunate truth is, our community overall, we're not yet living up to our potential. We have perfected the art of finding problems over and over again without addressing the root issues. 
Now, that doesn't mean we should stop finding bugs, but it does mean we've got to think a little more carefully about what we do downstream after that moment of discovery. And I really do think we have the potential to make the technology people de depend upon, something like three billion people on the planet who have internet access, that we have the ability to make their lives a little bit safer. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I think we can think about as a culture to get us there. So the, the first aspect of our culture I want to talk about is that we have a real tendency to focus on the complexity of a flaw instead of focusing on the real human harm. It's a little bit like we're still living in the 80s and we're watching the Olympics and we're expecting the East German judge to have a score for the difficulty of a gymnastics routine, right? That that's how hacking is judged. But the, the truth is, um, is that adversaries will do the simplest thing that they need to do to affect the, the, the cause that they want. Um, and in both security academia and in the security research community, we are still really focused on the really sexy, difficult problems. Now, it is really impressive to watch on stage one of our colleagues pull off an incredible hack to get around a bunch of anti-exploit technologies, um, but that doesn't necessarily follow that that problem will ever actually be seen in the real world. I've tried to capture in a couple of slides what risk looks like and actual human harm looks like from where we're sitting uh, as a platform that has a little over two billion people using it. Um, from my perspective, the vast, vast majority of human harm related to the misuse of technology falls into a category that we call abuse, which is well outside what information security generally considers its responsibility. Abuse is the technically correct use of a technology to cause harm. And abuse can range from things that are prevalent but only a bit irritating, like spam, to more serious issues like the doxing and harassment of people that you disagree with, all the way up to the sexual exploitation of adults and children. Real, real harm can happen in that category, and it's an area that we don't focus at all on in our field. And if we adjust our scale to be logarithmic so that we can look a little bit into that tip, even when you look at the issues that are part of traditional information security, the things that we see every single day that, cause, that violate people's privacy, that cause people to lose control of their personal information, are generally not very technically advanced. They are the application of prosaic issues that we have had for decades. The exact numbers fluctuate a lot, but we see something like three to four orders of magnitude more account takeovers due to passwords being reused than, than any other uh, thing that we can measure. And um, if you look at that slide and you look at the top, the vast majority of what we talk about is captured all there up in, in targeted attacks, in the attacks where you're going after a single target for a specific purpose. Now, because those attacks aren't incredibly prevalent, that doesn't mean that they're not important. And certainly we can all talk and come up with examples of situations uh, where targeted attacks have had a huge impact. But the truth is, is that 99% of our focus is on that triangle, and honestly, at the top end of that triangle in the O-Day section, and we have spent very little time thinking about or studying all the other reasons. And I do have O-Day up there, not because I don't think it's important, and I, I do thank people like Google's Project Zero for focusing on this issue, but I do think our overall discussion of this issue is massively dominated by specific O-Day problems, and that we don't think a lot about even targeted attacks that use standard off-the-shelf uh, issues. Second issue I'd like to talk about is, as a community, we have a tendency to punish people that implement imperfect solutions in an imperfect world. As an industry, we have a real problem with empathy. And I don't just mean empathy towards each other, which you can see if you hang out on IRC or social media for a little while, but we have a real inability to put ourselves in the shoes of the people that we're trying to protect. Who here has ever said or thought to themselves, oh, I, I found where the problem is, it's sitting between the chair and the keyboard. You can admit it, right? I think we've all thought about that. We've all had that thought probably about people that work at our companies behind the firewall that we're supposed to protect, as well as the people that use the products that we build. Um, and it's a common thought that everything would be better if users were perfect, uh, but it's, it's a really dangerous one. It's real dangerous for us to do this because it, it makes it very easy for us to shift the responsibility for building trustworthy, dependable systems off of ourselves onto other people. The modern world of technology is one that's full of tightropes. And for the most part, we have not put any nets under those tightropes. Don't click that link. 
Don't open that document. When you go to a website, make sure it's HTTPS. Oh, wait, there's a, a problem with your TLS negotiation? Well, here's a bunch of information, and just use your knowledge of X509 V3 and discrete mathematics to make an intelligent decision of whether you should accept this. Every single day, we ask billions of people to walk these tightropes. And if they fall off the tightrope, we just say, that's it. Can't do anything to help you. This is a real problem for us, and we've got to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who are using our products, and not just the people like our parents or our family members who we consider the users. We need to think of the billions of people who will be coming online in the next 20 years who have never been before been exposed to the Internet. There's a related and a really serious malady that affects a lot of people in our space and perhaps some people in this room. And that's a disease called security nihilism. Security nihilism is a set of beliefs such as the fact that all, all attackers are perfect, that everybody faces the worst possible threat scenario, or that any compromise you make to make a security feature more accessible should be considered a bug. Now look around yourself right now. Some of your friends might be suffering from security nihilism, so I'm going to give you some of the symptoms uh, so you can figure that out yourself. So some of these symptoms are, does your friend believe that every single person is the target of incredibly powerful adversaries like top-tier intelligence agencies? Does your friend call security features that have nothing to do with cryptography and that actually make a beneficial difference, does that friend call those security by obscurity? And does your friend think that it's better that a technology is theoretically perfect and never deployed out to anybody else rather than making compromises to make things widespread? These are pretty common beliefs. And if your friend's a security nihilist, you should be compassionate, right? You need to understand where they're coming from. Um, but we also need to start to push back against some of these ideas because it's making it difficult for us to affect real change. One example of, of this kind of thinking that happened about a decade ago uh, was around the, the rollout of the public cloud as, a, as a, a real thing that companies could do, and I'm particularly talking about infrastructure as a service. About 10 years ago, there's a whole bunch of great research into the isolation technologies that are deployed uh, in the public cloud. Hypervisors using GPUs to, to get into host memory, um, how to defeat network controls, how to map a network so that you can move around and, and pop onto the same host as your potential target. This research was all great, and in the long run, the fact that this research happened made the public cloud a lot more secure. But the problem wasn't the research itself. It was the idea that was sometimes pushed by the researchers, more often pushed by the media, that this research meant that the public cloud was not secure, that it was not an appropriate thing for any major company to move their data into the public cloud. And by this kind of thinking of that these security protections, which in reality turned out to be good enough, that these protections were not good enough distracted us from the real problem with the public cloud, which was all of the simple issues. People having credentials that are way too powerful. Uh, companies not setting up good network isolation. People taking their API keys and burning it into software. These are the issues that we've seen over and over again, not incredibly complex attacks against the GPU or the hypervisor. And when we get focused on these technically complex issues and then we make the judgment that the security protections are not good enough, it really does cause harm because a number of companies decided not to jump in the cloud, and that could have been a security and an operational benefit for them. And a lot of the researchers were distracted by the shiny objects instead of helping fix the real problems people had. There's another example of this actually involved us this year. Um, earlier this year, uh, there was a series of stories uh, about WhatsApp. WhatsApp rolled out end-to-end -end encryption for over a billion people. Uh, which is an incredible uplift in the privacy of people's communication. But to do that, they had to make some very difficult decisions and some hard trade-offs to make the end-to-end -end encryption usable by the huge diversity of people that use the product. Uh, a number of folks called some of these trade-offs an intentional backdoor. Uh, and this is, unfortunately, the kind of thinking that, that really holds people back from doing difficult things, like trying to roll out end-to-end -end encryption to billions, and makes it hard to have a, a good discussion about what, what the trade-off should be. Now, there's a, a happy ending to this story in that over 70 experts from our field publicly talked about how they didn't see this as a backdoor, and this was 
uh, the reasonable kind of risk management that a company should do. Um, but that's the kind of thing that I'm afraid is going to discourage smaller companies from taking risks and rolling out uh, crypto features, for example, that aren't absolutely perfect, uh, just in case that gets pointed out as being a massive flaw or an intentional issue. And then the third issue that I think our community has, especially recently, and it's a real important one, is the fact that we have not been very effective in engaging the world. And that's true both on a micro level in our individual engagements, uh, as well as in a geopolitical level. This is a truth that took me a little while to figure out. We are no smarter than the people whose systems we break. At least in my personal career, in situations where I've been successful in finding flaws in systems, it's because those systems have been built with really difficult constraints. And the truth is, is I could have done no better at building that system uh, than the software engineers who did it uh, and eventually created some kind of security flaw. It's really seductive to think of us this way, but the truth is, is that security people aren't brilliant. We're not that much smarter than everybody else. We bring a very important way of looking at the world and an important set of skills and tools, but that doesn't mean that we need to denigrate others when we point out their mistakes. We're not going to bug squash ourselves out of this current situation. The only way that systems are going to get better in the long term is by eliminating entire classes of bugs, by building architectures that are resilient to failure and that fail gracefully, and by building relationships between the security side and the builder side where we can move forward together. So this doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't go find bugs and tell people about it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do public disclosure. But the way we interact both internal to our companies, between the security team and the product teams, and then externally, really is critical. This humility gap, this empathy gap, also extends to big geopolitical issues. Probably the most intense period of debate in the U.S. around the benefits and the downsides of encryption was the fight last year between the Department of Justice and Apple, uh, where the DOJ was trying to force Apple to unlock an iPhone that was related to the San Bernardino terrorist attacks. There was a lot of good criticism of the government's position. Good academic papers, there were a bunch of amicus filings uh, made by advocacy groups and by other tech companies, and I think those arguments were, were effective in changing some minds. But for each one of those well-reasoned arguments, there was at least a dozen hot takes or online screeds calling people in the government stupid or evil. I know everybody here saw this kind of stuff, right? And some of us probably participated in this kind of online snark and argument where we automatically assume that if somebody wanted a solution to what they consider the encryption problem, that that's only because they don't know how crypto works, they don't understand math, they haven't thought about it really deeply, or because it's part of some massive mass surveillance conspiracy. Now, personally, I strongly believe that people have a right to secure computing and that people have a right to private communications that are free of mass surveillance. But that position is not automatically obvious. And just because somebody disagrees with me doesn't make them an idiot or make them evil. If you look at law enforcement, it actually turns out to be a lot like InfoSec in that it is a kind of family. It is a profession that has a real sense of community. And in my job, part of that job is to go around the world and to meet with people in governments and law enforcement and to talk about this issue. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to go to one of the law enforcement's big family reunions in the desert. Uh, in Dallas, there's going to be a conference called the Crimes Against Children Conference. And I've gone before, and as you can imagine, it is not the most uplifting conference in the world. Um, but it's incredibly uplifting to go there and to see thousands of people who have dedicated their lives to protecting children against abuse, both in the physical world and online. And when you go there and you meet these people, you realize they're not evil and they're not stupid. They are people who, just like us, believe that they can leave the world a little bit better than how they found it. And they have seen something that, that is true evil, and they've decided that they're going to combat it. And one of our problems as a community is it's very hard for us to have empathy with these folks who, who disagree with us. And so, you know, this debate isn't over. In fact, it's heating up again uh, really aggressively right now in a number of, of key democracies. And as this debate comes up, I, I'd just like to ask the community to help us out by 
having a little bit of thought and empathy for the people on the other side. Put yourselves in the shoes of somebody whose job it is to put child molesters in jail or to stop the growth of terrorist networks and think about what are the kinds of solutions that we might be able to offer that don't require back doors or don't require us to violate some of the, the principles that we hold very dear in this room. And that, if we do that, then our voices will actually be heard and we won't look childish and we won't look like people who aren't willing to engage in what is actually a, a very difficult topic. So we've, we've talked about three classes of issues, uh, the focus on complexity and not harm, the punishing of imperfect solutions in an imperfect world, uh, and the way we engage the world. And listening to me for 20 minutes, I, I could see how you would think that maybe I'm a pessimist. But I'm actually a real optimist about our field. And I'm optimistic because we're making a big deal that this is the 20th Black Hat, that this is one of the oldest security conferences in the world, and Black Hat is not yet old enough to even drink in Nevada, right? So we have a really, really young industry. We should still be incredibly agile, and we should be able to be flexible and address some of these fundamental issues. And I have some thoughts of, of ways we can do it, and those thoughts break into two categories, um, focusing on, on how we think about defense and the diversity of our field. So to, to first to think about defense. When I talk about defense, I'm not saying that offensive research is important. I believe that good, educated defense is the child of offensive research. And at Facebook, we live up to this. We have a dedicated red team that all they do all the time uh, is try to break into our systems. And a, a great deal of our roadmap on the defensive side is based upon the findings of the red team and our after action studies of how well our blue team responded to unannounced pen tests. Um, but I do believe that the public research that's available, the balance is still a little bit off. Our focus on technical complexity means we are not applying the intellectual frameworks we've built about the adversarial use of technology against some of the, the problems that actually affect millions of people every single day. And I think if we change the balance a little bit, we could actually impact a lot of people. So in support of offensive research, this is something that we continue to support. I'm a big fan of the internet bug bounty. I think bug bounties are fantastic overall. Uh, and we believe at Facebook that it's really important for big companies like us to support uh, the internet bug bounty because there are fundamental open source libraries and technologies that no single company owns. Uh, and so this year we've re-upped our sponsorship along with other uh, partners of ours of the internet bug bounty. But we also want to give people rewards for doing good practical defensive research. Since 2014, we've given out about $250,000 in the internet defense prize, which has traditionally gone to the best practical paper at the Usenix Security Symposium. These papers have actually been pretty influential. One of the winners uh, looked at the detection of second order vulnerabilities in web apps using static analysis. We've actually taken a bunch of those lessons and built it into the static analysis tools that run on all of our web properties. Another paper, the more recent winner, proposed a practical post-quantum computer uh, secure asymmetric crypto algorithm, which is the exact kind of research that we got to do right now if when quantum computers become practical, we still want to keep people's information secure. We are massively investing in this program, uh, and I'm happy to say in, in 2018, we're going to be giving out $1 million in internet defense prizes to encourage people to do research in areas that are traditionally not looked at, at either from academia or the security research community. So some of the categories that we'd love to see, looking at patch lag. Why are people not applying patches? What are the causes in corporate networks for, for patches not to be applied? Are there changes in the ways that we should architect software, or should we change the level of responsibility between the software maker and the user when it comes to patching? I'd love for people to look at practical account lifecycle management issues. So there's a lot of talk of authentication and two-factor auth, but authentication is only a point-in-time part of the overall lifecycle of somebody's relationship with an online service. And it would be great to have people think more about those other issues, like how do we stop contagion when an email address gets compromised? Uh, or what do we do if somebody has a really, really bad day and all of their computers have been stolen and they've forgotten their password because they haven't typed it in in a while? What are our solutions to those problems? Because it turns out the attackers know that's a hard problem and a lot of the issues that we see in the real world are not tied to authentication as much as account recovery. Um, and the, another field that we'd really like to see some research in, and it's one 
I'm personally really interested in is the security of the real mobile ecosystem as deployed. This room is full of $800 fully patched top of the line smartphones. This is not what the world looks like. When you have 2 billion users, you realize that hundreds of millions of people every day are using smartphones that cost something between $50 to $100 and that ship out of the factory with year-old or two-year-old Android. So those are vulnerable to dozens of problems on day one. We can't just write off these people. We can't say they're not worth protecting. And so at Facebook, we've done some work into trying to keep our app safe, even on insecure operating systems. And it would be great to see more public research and the kind of things people can do to do that. So we're going to be giving out that million dollars at a variety of different conferences during the year. If you're interested, we'll be doing a blog post soon with the details of how you can apply. And while we're focusing on defense, I think it's important also for us to broaden the scope of what we consider the security industry. As I, I showed in that triangle before, a huge amount of harm falls outside what we've always considered to be our problem. But the, the real issue is, is those issues are generally not anybody else's problem either. There are no conferences this size where people go talk about those areas of abuse. And the, I think the people who are best positioned in the world to think about these issues is us. People who have spent decades thinking about the ways technologies can be subverted and misused. This has personally been a big area of development for me. Uh, at Facebook because I've been exposed in my job to all of the new and, and perhaps much more subtle ways that technology can be misused. I'm guessing that most people in here heard there was an election in the United States last year, right? I don't have to give any background on that. Um, and that it's generally well established uh, both in the U.S. intelligence community and in our field uh, that there was attempts at outside influence. So Facebook, uh, we were very proud to write a paper I got to write this with my colleagues, Jen Whedon and Will Newland, in our DC office. And we wrote a paper about our observations in the US election uh, and in a variety of other situations around the world outside of elections, in which we, we tried to lay out a model of what a modern information operation looks like, a modern attempt to subvert somebody else's democracy using technical means. And when we broke down that model of, into these three phases, I started to realize that only a tiny fraction of this is generally considered to be responsible responsibility of our field. And so this is an area where we've had to do a lot of growth um, and to think a lot about what can we do to address these issues. Um, and that requires uh, a diversity of people and well, as well as partnership with all kinds of different fields and people with, with experience in, in different areas. You might have seen that last week uh, Harvard announced in their Belfer Center uh, the creation of the Defending Digital Democracy Project. So this is a bipartisan initiative that's aimed at studying the influence of democracies from the outside and trying to figure out ways to address it. This project is being led by Eric Rosenbach, who was the Ass Assistant Secretary of State, oh, I'm sorry, who was the ex-Assistant Secretary of Defense, and Matt Rhodes and Robbie Mook, uh, who were the campaign managers for Mitt Romney and Hillary Clinton, respectively. So Facebook is a part of this project, and I'm happy today to talk for the first time about what we're trying to do. So we are the founding sponsor of this work, and the first big project that we're going to be working on uh, with our friends at the Belfer Center is the, the building of a shared, an information sharing and analysis organization, or an ISAO, that covers all of the vulnerable areas of our democracy. Why do we need to do this? So while this is focused on international issues, I'll talk a little bit about the particular problem facing the US. In November of next year, there are going to be 435 House races, 33 Senate races, a little over 30 gubernatorial races, and thousands of local and state races. For each of those elections, there's probably at least two campaigns. And these campaigns are not things that are run centrally. Each campaign is a small startup that is built up from scratch, probably late this fall, early in the spring, and they get torn down right after the election. The vast majority of campaigns run their own IT, and they have to run their own IT either with volunteers or sometimes with paid staff. And in either situation, it's very difficult to find people who have experience dealing with incredibly advanced threat adversaries like those that we have to deal with every day. So part of our goal here is to think about what are the things we can do 
to help these people help themselves? What can we provide as an industry overall so that they can protect themselves, set up good IT infrastructures, build scalable systems, build resilient systems, and then if something happens, how can we help them? Can we build a real-time information sharing in a bipartisan fashion between campaigns and parties without having to get the government involved? Can we provide incident response help uh, in, in the situation where uh, an attack has already happened and, if, and we have the ability to mitigate harm before things get worse? So we're going to be working on those issues and asking those questions, and that's starting in September, uh, where we're bringing a, a cross-section of uh, representative cross-section of local and state election officials to the Facebook DC office, and we're going to be talking about where they are from a security perspective and what kinds of things the tech industry and the security community can do to help them. All of these issues I've talked about today, though, are, are tied to one big underlying issue, and that is one that affects both our community and our industry. And it's the fact that we do not have the diversity that reflects the people that we're trying to protect. I've used the word empathy a lot. And clearly, any of us can empathize with a struggle that somebody else is going through. But in security, we've got to do more than empathize. We have to foresee the problems people are going to see with technologies. And then we have to understand what kind of solutions are actually practical in a specific cultural situation. And to do that, it's much easier to do that if you're part of a team that has people that reflects that diversity. And when I say diversity, I do mean a diversity of people, but I also mean a diversity of backgrounds and a diversity of ways of thinking. And we, we lack all of those in our industry right now. Uh, for example, when we do our work on securing, securing elections, it is really important for us to have people who have not pure technical backgrounds. A lot of the people who have working on those issues for us have undergraduate degrees in international relations or foreign languages, or master's degrees from things like the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. These people have come to our team with a variety of different backgrounds, and some of them have learned the technical side of our field on the fly, and, we've, and have been very, very effective in merging up their history with the kinds of things that we're able to do in our team. This is a big, my big advice for, for other CISOs in the room. Building a diverse team with diverse backgrounds is really key because you never know what kind of problem you're going to get into. And so it's, it's much better to have a toolbox of all kinds of different kinds of tools um, than to only have the best screwdrivers in the world, right? And, and I think it's really important for us to address this both from a management perspective and individually. So we've done a lot to try to support this. Uh, and I hope some of the people in the room will support some other diversity initiatives. Uh, we like to fund Capture the Flag in hackathons around the world. Um, I had an incredible experience meeting students in Nigeria at a hackathon that we had sponsored where they looked at real issues that Nigerians were facing. Um, we're a sponsor of Roots later this week to try to get really young people interested in security early. Uh, we like to run these intense middle school camps for middle school girls on our campus, which has been an incredible experience. Um, and there's a great resource, re resource that exists now that most of us never had a chance to, to play with, which is the fact that there are competitive CTF teams at the middle school, high school, and collegiate level. And we sponsor a bunch of those, not just because of the benefit to the kids on the teams, but the fact that these teams go and represent their high schools at state or national, and they come back with a big award, and they're treated just like they're athletes. And so exposing the entire school to the idea that you can use your brain and do hacking competitively, and it's just as interesting as winning a basketball tournament, is something that has a, a real kind of cultural impact. Moving forward, one of our big areas is to try to find a way to build cybersecurity programs at outside of the small number of universities that the tech industry traditionally recruits from. And so to do that, we've worked with an organization called CodePath, and we've created a hybrid online and in-classroom cybersecurity course aimed at students who have never been exposed to our field at all. And the goal is putting them through this course and finding students who are interested in this field and then, and then bringing them into a number of structured internships to prepare them for full-time jobs. So we've rolled that, we're rolling that out to these six universities, CSU San Bernardino, Merritt College in Oakland, Mississippi State, City College of New York, Hofstra and Virginia Tech. And as you'll probably notice, this is a variety of four and two year schools, and also schools that have a much more diverse student body than we normally recruit in security. And I'm really excited about this, in fact, 
partially because we have over 40 students and professors from these schools with us today. They're sitting in section 105. I'm gonna embarrass them by pointing over there. Can we get a spotlight on section 105? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, And I really want to thank Black Hat. Facebook was happy to pay for travel for these students. Black Hat donated uh, their, their passes to the briefings. And they're also sitting with representatives from the International Consortium of Minority Cybersecurity Professionals and the Executive Women's Forum. So if you run into these folks today, who I think most of them are here for their first Black Hat, this is your opportunity to meet some of that next generation and to talk to them and welcome them and to talk to them about what you do and, and perhaps find somebody uh, that you can mentor or hire in the future. And while it's important to develop that incoming talent, it's also really critical that we retain the talent we already have. And to do that, we have to create an environment that's open and welcoming to diverse people and diverse viewpoints. One of the steps that we have found to be most effective at Facebook in this is to first work on diversifying our management team. Um, and I'm very excited uh, to be able to say that almost half of our management and leadership team is now women. And that has been incredibly effective in both finding talent and then giving an example of how you can rise up through the ranks even if you, you are coming in to security for the first time. Um, and also at Facebook, we have the benefit of being part of a company that focuses on, on, on these issues a lot. Uh, we have an HR team that's really aggressive in making sure that we promote people fairly, that looks at compensation issues. Uh, we have classes for both managers and individuals on unconscious bias. So that's the idea that all of us bring bias to our work and that it's better to recognize that bias and deal with it instead of pretending that we're bias free and, and perfect people. Um, and we do have a lot of cultural norms like expecting ex new fathers to take as much parental leave as new mothers. But while those things are all important, from my perspective, the most important thing any leader of a team can do is to try to create a culture that is open and respectful in discussing these issues. And this is something that I I've learned myself. Uh, shortly after coming to Facebook, I had a situation in which I was sitting in a meeting with a young female engineer on my team and two not quite as young male engineers. And they were discussing uh, some technical topic of how we were going to solve an issue. And the, the two male engineers were pretty, being pretty dismissive and aggressive with her. And I saw this as a problem and I decided I was going to swoop in and protect her. And I took her side, and I defended her, and I squashed those two guys uh, who were like three levels below me in the org chart, um, and I felt really good about it. And coming out of that meeting, that female engineer pulled me aside uh, and very patiently explained to me why I should absolutely never do that again. <laughs> and she explained to me that, that I had diminished her in the eyes of her coworkers, that I had implied that I didn't think she could make a technical argument on her own, and that going forward, that was gonna make it harder for her to do her job and feel like she belonged. And this is really tough, right? It's really hard to feel like you're the good guy and you did the right thing, and then to be brought low immediately. But in the end, this really worked out. And it worked out because we had a culture where skip levels can come to their managers and directors and talk to them about these things. And we had a culture where both of us were assuming good intent on the other side. I didn't think she was trying to criticize me unnecessarily. She didn't think I was coming from a bad place. We had an open, honest discussion. I thanked her for that feedback. And I just went on with my day trying to be much more careful about it. And it's that kind of open culture that can make us all better. Now, not everybody in here uh, is in a position where they can change HR policies uh, or they have the ability to, to, to change how hiring happens, although, Every single one of us can have influence on our organizations and can go back to demand these things. But not everybody in here is a hiring manager, I understand that. But every single person in here does have a really important power. And that's the power of inclusion. The power of this family is that by including people, we can build them up and we can give them culture and experiences and knowledge that makes them very, very useful in the future, that are very useful for their career and that makes them powerful in the future. But that power, the flip side, is the, the harm we cause by exclusion. And that's what I, I'd like everybody to think about this week, is our behavior this week in Vegas has more impact than just on what individual people think about you. Our collective behavior decides who feels welcome in this community and therefore who we're, are going to be our colleagues for the next several decades. So 
Every single one of you, I'd like you to think about that this week. Think about the things you're saying to people. When you make small little snide comments or you ask a female speaker if she's here with her boyfriend, think about what kind of impact that has on people. Think about whether that makes other people feel like they don't belong. And think about the, all the benefits that you have gone from being part of this community and what you're taking away from them. Because this isn't just about doing the right thing. It's not just about diversifying our community. It's about building the ability for us to address these problems over the next decades. Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. The, the number of people online is getting larger. And we're not living up to that potential yet. And a big part of it is we don't have enough people and we don't have the right people. And a lot of that starts here. So let's make this a special week in Vegas at whatever event you're at, and let's be really careful to be thoughtful about how we're treating other people. And if you see things that you don't think are right, then make sure you call them out. Because you can be the Calvary, you don't have to wait for somebody else to come and say that that wasn't right. You yourself can change how people feel in the sphere around you. It's a critical moment. We've been asking people to pay attention to us for over 20 years, and they are. We have the world's attention. What are we going to do with it? This is what I'd like to do with it. I'd like us to focus on fixing. I'd like us to have empathy for the people that use the technologies we build, and I'd like us to foresee the ways that they can be harmed and move really quickly to mitigate it. I'd like us to put as much thought into how do we eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities and not just into spectacular demonstrations on stage. And it would be great if we could, as a group, be humble in the way we interact with the rest of the world. Let's be careful of how we talk to people in our companies and around the world because it really does have an impact on our ability to be heard. And then let's work, starting this week, but every single day, back at work, or, or whether you're in a community event, let's work to make this a welcoming community where everybody feels like they can be part of making this, the future more safe and secure. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Have a fantastic Black Hat. That was really good. That was really good. All right. We are now going to move into our general sessions at 1030. You've got a little time to get out of here. And then tonight at 530, we've got the big welcome reception in the business halls. And I will see you all there. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful black hat.